is whose? Ours. Ours too. That's one of the most amazing verses in the entire Bible. That God wants to pour out his blessings on us. That we're going to have unlimited access to to the blessings of God. To his kingdom eternal. Just like Jesus Christ when we give our lives to him. But we have to choose that. He's not going to force us to go to heaven. How do we choose that? Well, we say, Lord, I put my trust in you. Jesus, I give you my life. I accept what you did on the cross for me. I believe in you. I want to love you. I want to know you more. And you give your life to Christ. And when you do that, you become a child of God. There's a lot of people going around the world saying that everybody in the world is God's children. You guys know that? They say that. Everybody's a child of God. But that's just not biblical. The Bible says that everybody is a creation of God, but only those who put their faith in Jesus Christ have the right or the authority to become children of God. John 1.12 says that. I want you to notice this verse in Romans. Romans 8, it says this in verse 17b, it says this. This is something we need to know. It says, but if we are to share his glory, we must also share his sufferings. You know, a lot of times in the world we think... God just wants to be good to me. You know, when when everything's going great, God's happy with me. And when things are miserable, God must be after me. But that's just not the truth. The scripture says in this world, we will have problems. How many of you ever have a problem? Raise your hand. If you don't raise your hand, I'm going to pray that you will get a problem today. Let's ask that question. How many of you have ever had a problem? Okay. I saw you if you didn't raise your hand. No, I'm just messing around. The scripture says that we will suffer. We'll have problems. There will be difficulties in our life. There's going to be mistakes and there's consequences to those mistakes. There's people right now in this world today who are suffering because they're followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you too. Jesus says, you want to share my glory? Know that there's going to be times of suffering. It's not going to last forever, but there will be times that it comes. But I want you to notice this. Yet... What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will give us later. It's nothing. If you've had a difficult life, if you've had difficulties in your life, Christ says, I came that you may have an abundant life now, but that life is still going to have problems. But you can have hope knowing that God is with you. And one day all those problems are going to go away forever. I want you to notice this next point. Not only have we been given uh, the eternal life, but number five says, I've been given a life's purpose. I have been given a life's purpose. And I say this a lot in this church because it's true. God can take our lives, take the mistakes that we've made, turn them around for something amazing. Something wonderful. He can take the worst sin that has ever happened in your life and turn it around and use you for an amazing purpose in this world if you trust him. How do I know that's true? Well, let me just share this. What's the worst thing that has ever happened in the history of our world? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's the murder of God. That Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, came to earth and he was nailed to a cross, a horrible thing, so that he could bring about a good thing. You and I get an opportunity to go to heaven. He was able to take the worst thing. Well, how is this true? Let me give this. Let me give you an example. In Matthew chapter one, if you have your Bible, do me a favor. Flip over to Matthew chapter one. We're not going to read a lot, but I want to point out uh, three women in this chapter who... um, who were given another opportunity. How can Jesus, how can he turn around a life and turn it around for the better? Well, he mentions, actually there's four women that are mentioned in this scripture, in in this genealogy of Jesus, which is pretty much unheard of because women were not thought of very highly in that time. But Jesus put, the God allowed uh, Matthew to write this passage and to include these women for a reason. I want to show you them. In verse 5 in in Matthew chapter 1, there's a woman and her name is uh, Rahab. Now you you want to circle that name. Rahab was her name. Now how many of you know what Rahab was known for? If you were here in the first service, don't answer. (laughs) How many of you know what Rahab was known for? Anybody? Yes. 
She was the prostitute that helped the spies with the Jericho project. Exactly. She was a prostitute. Rahab was a prostitute who helped the spies who went into the land. Remember I talked about that? How they went into the land. She was the one that helped them out. And, and she became a follower of God's. And God took that life and turned it around. And Rahab was one of Jesus' ancestors. Way, way back, he was related to this woman who was a prostitute. That's pretty cool that he would use a woman like that or any of us, to be honest with you. There's a woman in verse 5. Her name was Ruth. Uh, Ruth wasn't even Jewish. Now, God had chosen his, the Jewish race to be his people, but God was going to use somebody outside of the Jewish uh, line to, to preserve this line of David. Her name was Ruth. She was a Moabite. She was married to a Jewish man illegally. Why? Because Jews weren't allowed to marry somebody outside of their faith. And she became this woman of God, and she was also part of this lineage of Jesus. There's another woman. Her name is not mentioned, but it's found, uh, I believe it's in verse 6. And it says that David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. How many of you know her name? Uriah's wife. Bathsheba was her name. You might want to write that down somewhere. Bathsheba, what was she known for? She was known for having an adulterous affair with the king. Right? Isn't that true? King David had this uh, adulterous affair with this woman named Bathsheba. And yet God preserved this lineage that would ultimately bring about the Savior of the world. Now, I don't care what you've done or where you come from or what your background is or how many mistakes you've made. God can change your life to become exactly what he wants it to be if you just let him. It's an amazing thing. In the Romans 8, 26, it says this. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. God's Spirit not only helps us to stop sinning, but when you're weak, He helps us when our, we're weak. For we did not know how to pray as we should. How many of you have ever been in that situation where you just didn't know what to say to God? God, I want to say something. I just don't know what to say. I feel so horrible about this thing that has happened in my life, God. I'm just at a loss. I've heard stories of people just weeping bitterly because of something that they've done. And that's all they could offer was tears and shame. Well, I want you to notice this. In the same way, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The Bible says that God prays for you. When you don't know what to pray, God prays for you. And it's, it's an amazing prayer. The words can't even describe what God is saying about you because he loves you. And the scripture says he helps us in these weaknesses. Let me give you a sixth reason we can have hope this morning. And that's this. I don't need to fear anything anymore. I don't have to fear anything. Doctors have said that there are 645 different fears that people have in the world today. Isn't that a lot of fears? How many of you are afraid of heights in the room? How many of you are afraid of falling down in the room? I don't know. I just made that up. <laughs> How many of you are afraid of spiders in the room? Spiders? How many love spiders? We'll help you connect with those who don't. <laughs> the scripture says we don't have to fear anything. That no matter what comes our way, no matter what difficulties, no matter what our health issues are, we don't have to fear. And because of that, we can have hope. Notice this verse in verse 31 in Romans 8. It says, what can we say about such wonderful things as these? The things we've been talking about already. If God is for us, what does the rest of it say, guys? Who can ever be against us? Now, if God is for us, who can be against us? I mentioned the angels this morning. The angels are down. I couldn't be at today's game. I was asked to go, but I wanted to be with you guys. Isn't that cool? All right. You're the 11 o'clock service. I could have blew you off, right? I wanted to be here with you guys. 
The Angels are down to their last, their last game. They have to win today or it's over for them for the year. But the Red Sox are on the other side, and they're thinking, we're going to beat them today. Now notice this, guys. No matter what team you face in life, no matter who comes up against you, you and God are the majority. Glory. Isn't that good? You and God already won. The scripture says we've already won. All you have to do is read the last book of the Bible to find out it's over. Game over. We won. We're just waiting to go home. 